JM on Cars is sponsored by Car Vertical. With just a registration number, or even better, a VIN, Car Vertical will search over 20 European databases to find out whether any car you're looking at has a hidden past. They can see if a vehicle was used as a taxi, stolen, suffered fire damage, or involved in a crash, even when it wasn't written off, so could pass other checks. Car Vertical is now an essential tool in my car buying kit, putting all the information I need to know together in one easy to read report. Even better, if you follow the link in the description down below, you'll get 10% off. A big thank you to them for being today's sponsor. Hello everybody. Cars are certainly a divisive topic, but by and large you will generally find that opinion more or less matches between reviewers and the public. There are some exceptions of course, but usually most people will agree what's a good car and what is a bad car. But then there is the Lexus SC430, according to Car and Driver, an unqualified success. And according to Top Gear, or more accurately, James May and Jeremy Clarkson, the worst car in the history of the world. Their reasoning used for that conclusion was interesting, but I think sound. You see, they said that Lexus was a company which clearly knew how to make a car because they have made some of the best cars in the world. The LFA was the example that they cited, and I'll tell you that the LC500 is also brilliant. And then you have this, which is bug ugly, doesn't perform very well, doesn't ride very well, and clearly has no redeeming features whatsoever. How is it then that we arrive at two such polarizing opinions? On the one hand, something award-winning, and on the other hand, something utterly and totally derided. I personally think if it wasn't quite such a challenging car in the looks department and hadn't been featured on that Top Gear special, I think the SC430 would be one of those cars that nearly everyone simply never knew even existed. They wouldn't have had the time to forget it because they wouldn't have even known about it in the first place. However, it is what it is, and so it presents to me an interesting opportunity. Quite a few videos have been made talking about why this isn't the worst car in the world, so I'm not going to be using that as today's topic. Instead, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the nature of automotive journalism, and of course, firstly, I must deliver my own verdict on the SE430. I've done things a little bit backwards today. Usually, I'll do my drive and review first, and then my drive buys second, but we've actually done it the other way around to try and get the traffic at its optimum. This is not the sort of car that I tend to drive, if there is a typical car for me. It's a very serene thing and totally different in character to the Lexus LC convertible that I took out recently. This is obviously aimed much more at the more leisurely driver who isn't really interested in such vulgar things as going fast. It isn't a numbers car, but if you're really, really desperate to know, power is about 300 horsepower, torque is just over 300 pound feet, and that comes courtesy of a beautifully smooth 4.3 litre naturally aspirated V8, which is mated to a regular torque converter five speed automatic. Had Lexus continued to use such combinations in their cars, I probably would have bought one of late. However, they really went in heavy for the hybrid thing and then paired all of those engines with CVTs or ECVTs or whatever they want to call them. And that just doesn't really work for me. That means the only cars left in the Lexus range are ones that I can't afford, like the LC500, the GSF, so on and so forth. So, the SC430. Let's begin with the looks. It is horrendous, really quite awful. This was designed from the ground up as a convertible and those often have an issue with trying to look good both roof up and roof down and usually fail in one regard or the other. The SC430 not so much because this is equally as gopping whether you've got the lid on or not. Next up on Top Gear's hit list was the ride. This car is no longer standard. Incidentally, it belongs to a lovely chap called Ross, who runs a company called Blackbeard's Detailing. I've actually featured one of the cars he worked on previously, the Nissan R35 GTR, which he did an excellent job of. He is based just north of Glasgow, and if you're in the area and you want a top quality job on your car, 
do get in touch with him. I'll, I'll put his Instagram details up here. Now, when he got the car, which he's only had for a few months, he said that it was a very, very unpredictable thing. So he's replaced the dampers with OE ones, but just fresher items, and put H&R lowering springs on it and some fairly chunky spacers. They're 25 mil on the front and 35 mil on the back. Despite this though, the rear wheels still sit in the arches quite some way. I can only imagine how awkward it must have looked when it was brand new. Mercifully, he's also done the discs, pads and tyres, he's put Brembo items on and Michelin Pilot Sport 4s, so it should handle and drive reasonably well. Scuttle shake is unfortunately very much present and correct here, and I do not know how Lexus, as a really engineering obsessed company, allow their cars to go out like this. There's no need for it. This is a heavy old thing, it's around about 1.8 tonnes, so no one's really going to be that upset if you put another 20 or 30 kilos in and stop it wobbling about. Driving along on a smooth road at 40, 50 or so, it's okay, but around town and roads like this where you've got little patches of tarmac and manhole covers and that kind of thing, it's really quite bad to the extent that um, this windscreen starts twerking on occasion. I was curious as to why Ross, who's a sort of young, beardy chap with tattoos, would be interested in a car that is clearly the Miami retiree's weapon of choice. He's just into his Japanese cars and he wanted a convertible to simply potter about in and just enjoy over the summer. As a thing to do that, I suppose it works reasonably well. The engine is buttery smooth, the gearbox a bit reluctant, although I'll put it into power mode and it's still reluctant, so that's a failed experiment. Being a Lexus, it of course should be hewn from granite, wobbly granite, evidently, and the idea is that it shouldn't really cost much to run. Only one thing has gone wrong in the brief time that he's had it, and that was an O2 sensor. 80 pound part from Bosch, and done. Fixing the O2 sensor did, however, improve the fuel economy. This car was previously averaging about 17, now it's closer to around 22 which still isn't great, is it? Even for a 4.3 litre V8. The thing that struck me most when I saw this car, beyond the fact that I wanted to scratch my own eyes out, was that it's actually not that big. It's presented here in the sort of usual silvery colour, which I suppose is a step up from the weird kind of champagne-y tone many of them are in. And it doesn't feel that large at all. It, it's, it is bigger than a, a box or something like that. And you have these sort of token plus two seats in the rear that are of no use to man or beast, unless it's a very small beast. And the boot is actually very, very small. The idea that Lexus sent all of their designers on a holiday to Europe to find inspiration for this is something of a joke because um, I don't feel particularly inspired in this thing. Quite what it was that car and driver saw in this, I really don't know, nor care. If I was going to have to nail my colours to the master, they would more or less align with that of Top Gear. This isn't an inherently bad car, but Lexus really can do so very much better, as evidenced by the LC convertible, a still oddly flawed car, but one that's certainly much more successful than this. So the meaty topic of today then, how is it that you wind up with two, in theory, qualified professionals delivering almost completely the opposite verdict on the same car? Having been now in the sort of automotive journalism world for a few years, I do find it a very, very odd thing. And this may be somewhat counterproductive and perhaps a, a, a little bit, um, I don't know, self-harming maybe to say, but I'm not sure how many car journalists I actually trust when it comes to reviews. The really curious one is when I speak to the odd journalist, influencer, YouTuber or whatever, and ask them their opinion on a car and, and they'll give me a very accurate, insightful and honest piece of feedback on it. However, when I read the articles they've written or watch the videos they've made, I will see that the opinion they gave me and the one they give the public do differ somewhat. There are always some accusations levelled at YouTubers in particular and influencers I suppose along with them that we are afraid to give honest opinions because we won't ever get another press car, that we're always just 
too keen to appease, or this idea that we've been somehow influenced by these lovely first-class flights, this lobster and caviar breakfast and all that kind of thing. The fact is that actually, 20 odd years ago, things were far, far more lavish than they are now. Ask any journal who's been in the business for a long time and they'll tell you that the heyday was a long time ago. Budgets have been cut across the board, they have more people to please and the whole idea of trying to spend a fortune on somebody that's just going to review a product and not buy it is just an alien concept now. So things are really very different. What has changed is that when an influencer goes on a press tour and gets put up in a nice hotel, they'll probably choose to make a whole video dedicated to the hotel itself and their Thermidor supper. Whereas car journos just get on with the business of driving it and delivering their verdict. I can only speak for myself, but I have never ever felt beholden to any company to deliver anything other than a perfectly honest review. In fact, I know several that have said they want to work with me because they respect the fact that that is what I do. I'm sure there are others out there who don't answer my emails because they know they're going to get an honest answer from me and to date there is only one company that has ever said anything negative to me about a video that I have done on one of their products. That's it. And it, it wasn't McLaren, by the way, nor was it Ferrari. Ferrari actually are one of the best for tolerating my somewhat sort of slightly scathing opinions of certain elements of their cars. And I know people wouldn't really expect that of them, but that's been my experience. And I will only ever go on my own experience when it comes to these things. With regards to the SC430 specifically, you might say, ah, well, Car and Driver is an American outlet and this is very clearly a car designed for the American marketplace where there's nice flat smooth roads and no bends to go around. However, that's not true. They've got some amazing driving roads in America and their roads are really badly paved. I mean, seriously, they are awful. If you have driven around Miami, you'll know what I mean. You need something that rides really, really well. And this, okay, it's not standard anymore, doesn't. One thing this car does certainly have in its favour is a feeling of really solid build. That's the one lexus element that certainly shines through. It's really, really nicely put together. There's some screens and things here and they're all well hidden away behind little pieces of wood veneer and, and the cup holders are a little bit of artwork. I do love a sexy cup holder in a car and these ones are particularly trick. So am I saying that you can't trust car journalists? No, 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 a absolutely not. There are maybe some out there that you can't, but I would say by and large that they are greatly outnumbered by those who do have a, a decent sense of integrity. And that stretches, by the way, to YouTubers as well. It Lifestyle vloggers and influencers perhaps are a little bit less so, but then what they're selling generally isn't really actually a review. They're not, they're not trying to tell you the good and bad bits of a car like I do. They're just trying to promote it. They're trying to show you, here's some things that I've done. And as long as they're honest about that, I've no issue with that kind of thing. I did once go on a car launch of a, a very, very sporty car and somebody sent out a person that didn't have a driving license. I was out yesterday in the Honda NSX, which can run as an EV, and I swear, around town, and at low speeds like that, this is quieter. <laughs> it does make a noise if you put your foot down, but it also feels a little bit, a little bit wrong. You know what I was saying about that whole Lexus reliability? Thing, the, um, the traction control is broken. Although I was warned that if you do reverse and you try and go on full lock, that can happen. The next thing I'm going to be driving down here is also Japanese, but about as far away from an SC430 as you could possibly imagine. I'm rather looking forward to that. But I've also genuinely enjoyed driving this car because a lot of the stuff I drive is, is quite shouty, quite loud, quite brash. And I do feel perhaps a, a little bit self-conscious at how much attention I might be attracting, much of it unwanted when I, I, I do that. Um, this though, not a problem. 
You see, when I was filming up a dan here with a Lamborghini, I, I wound up absolutely terrifying the life out of one of the many sheep on the hills around here. I was filming some drive-bys earlier, and this car was so sedate that it drove past a sheep and it fell into a coma. I have almost never in my life felt less inclined to put my foot all the way down. I will, because it's my job. Oof. Oh, it doesn't like this at all. And the steering jiggles a little bit. The chassis is not happy. Oh, it's very firm. This is not a good ride. Only when the tarmac is absolutely pristine does this deliver an even remotely acceptable ride. Lexus, what were you thinking? Now, where was I? So, I'm not saying that you can't trust car journalists, not in the least, but what I am saying is this. Pay more attention to the car journalists' names. I'm sure you'll know many of them. It's particularly easy if you're watching their videos. You'll know people like Chris Harris, Jeremy Clarkson, maybe to a lesser extent, Matt Pryor, Steve Sutcliffe, people like Henry Catchpole, all these guys. And what you'll begin to learn is that we've all got our own sets of values, our core beliefs as to what cars should be like, what we do enjoy, what we don't enjoy. And you'll then begin to learn how much your opinion will align with ours because in many topics there isn't really a right or a wrong. It's like Obi-Wan said, everything is true from a certain point of view and I think the SC430 is maybe that car that just sort of landed in that sort of perfect storm of somebody in a different place with a, a different background has looked at this car and said, yeah, no, this is, the, this is the thing, this is exactly what I want. And then somebody else in a different time and place has looked at it and gone, no, no, this is awful, this is terrible. I would love to say, in some weird way, they were both right. When it comes to the SC430, I don't think they were <laughs> at all. But if you want something to just tool about in, you could probably do worse. One strange thing with these is that they are way more expensive than I figured. I thought it'd be like, you know, five, six grand, there you go. And indeed, five or six grand will get you into one, but that's the bottom end of the market. Some of these are up for sale at 20,000 quid. You can buy a real car for that much money. This one certainly does the breed justice because it's been kept in reasonably good condition. There's a few things that Ross I know is going to be sorting over the winter, but largely it is a fine example. However, it is sadly a fine example of a not brilliant car. And I say that because this just isn't to my taste. I would want a car to be either quite a bit more luxurious, soft and costing than this, or quite a bit more capable and more sporting. Because that's what I expect from this car. And so that's why my verdict is that no, it's not the worst car in the history of the world ever, but it probably is the worst Lexus I've ever driven. Though I haven't driven many. And that's another reason that journalists will sometimes give you very different opinions. I've gone through the whole learning experience myself. You know, we can't start out having driven every car. There is a point where you have to start just being a car journalist and your own knowledge is gonna be somewhat limited. Then as you grow, so does your knowledge base, so does your frame of reference, so does your idea of what is good, what is bad, what is in between, and time will change these things as well. So when you are looking up a review for a car, don't just read it see who's written it, look at some of their past reviews, perhaps of cars you have experienced, and see if your opinions match up. Because if they do, then maybe you'll be able to trust theirs a little bit more. And the final thing I would say about car journalists in general, in terms of say perhaps just myself, I would be absolutely terrified that anybody had made a car purchasing decision based solely on what I had to say, 
I always get worried when people come up to me and say, oh, James, I bought this car because you're a review. And I'm like, oh, did you? Oh, blooming heck. These videos for me are, I think, just a guide to give you an idea as to whether it's a car worth more of your time. If you're thinking of buying something, you're like, oh, I've got to go watch JM's review of that. And then if I do say, well, this is good, this is bad, this is good, you can pick and choose. And you go, well, he said that this was a certain way, but actually that's what I want. And so therefore just use it to help you make your decision. Please don't make your whole decision based on me. That's too much stress and hassle and pressure. I can't take it. Nor can I take these indicator stalks. What the hell? These are ancient. Not like ones in my Celica. <laughs> anyway, this was the Lexus SC430. Strange beastie that it is. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.